Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. Story hit my radar, and these stories always fascinate me. A man has been freed after spending 16 years in a Michigan prison for a murder he did not commit. Well, for a crime he didn't commit. Um, there's several aspects to this. But the Western Michigan University Cooley Innocence Project, and Western Michigan University, of course, is a, a big school. Cooley is a law school that's affiliated with several different schools. Uh, and their Innocence Project collaborated to secure the release of a man named Corey McCall, who had spent nearly 16 years in prison for a crime he did not commit. And now this one does not involve DNA testing, but there are other ways that you can prove your innocence, uh, even after you've been supposedly proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And that, of course, is the big question is, how does that happen? Berrien County Circuit Court Judge Angela Pasala set aside the conviction of Corey McCall, who was wrongfully convicted of three counts of murder and one count of attempted murder in 2005. So think back to 2005 and imagine that you spent all the time since then in prison for a crime you did not commit. And by the way, Berrien County is down here, bottom left-hand corner of the state of Michigan, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the state and how the Lower Peninsula is shaped like a hand. Uh, Berrien County prosecutor said during McCall's hearing Friday, there are no words to meet the moment. It is tragic that you serve time for this offense. So in one of those interesting twists, the prosecutors and the people in this case are not saying, hey, this guy did it. We still think he did it. They're actually saying that not only is he innocent, but that he didn't do it. And that's a distinction you might think, Steve, only an attorney could make that distinction. But it's an important one because occasionally you'll hear the people get freed and they'll say, well, we're going to overturn the result because the trial wasn't fair, but we're not going to retry him, but we still think he did it. Here, the prosecutors have actually come out and said, this man is innocent. He did not do it. And that's a very, very unusual and an extra step they took. Uh, the assistant attorney general, um, Robin Frankel, who is the director of the Michigan Attorney General's Conviction Integrity Unit and the Berrien County Prosecutor, moved to have McCall's conviction vacated and dismissed all charges. Uh, McCall is represented by Tracy Brame of the Western Michigan University Cooley Law School Innocence Project. And this is the interesting thing is that Michigan's attorney general created a conviction integrity unit. And they're actually going through and double checking some of the work done by prosecutors in the past. And if somebody was guilty back then and the trial was fair and the evidence holds up, great. There's nothing wrong with double-checking your math. And I've actually had people say, but Steve, this is a little bit too much. You know, they were convicted by a jury. We know that mistakes get made. So think of it as simply double-checking your math. Nothing wrong with that. doesn't hurt. It's not, it's, not, it, it's not that we're trying to prove the math is wrong. Okay? Two plus two equals four. Double-check it. Yep, still equals four. There you go. Frankel noted that at his sentencing back in 2005, McCall said on the record... I want to say that I am innocent. So the man steadfastly stuck to his guns, kept insisting he was innocent back then, today, and all in between. During the hearing on Friday, uh, Frankel spoke directly to McCall and offered the Attorney General's office's deepest apologies for what has been taken from you. So they actually apologized. Mr. McCall was convicted despite evidence of an alibi. Now, this is the interesting thing. Not all alibis are airtight, and, and not all alibis just automatically prove that you, you know, were innocent. But new evidence demonstrated that he is, in fact, innocent. And now this statement, that the man is, in fact, innocent, is very, very interesting. Because they're not saying everything they have. Because presumably, since McCall didn't do it, someone else did do it who's been free for the last 16 years. And we've talked about this before, that it's several problems when the wrong person gets convicted for a crime. Because a crime gets committed, they arrest somebody, charge them, convict them, and that person goes to prison. If that's the wrong person, that's problem number one. The wrong person's in jail. People often forget, but number two, the guy who did it, or gal, is still out there and not being punished. And we've heard of stories before where somebody goes out, commits a crime, someone else goes to prison for the crime, and this person keeps committing crimes. So that's the third part, is that 
by not getting the right person, there might be more crimes down the road. So the Western Michigan University Cooley Innocence Project was proud to assist in the examination and consideration of forensic evidence in this case, the attorney said. The Attorney General's Conviction Integrity Unit's thorough investigation led to a just result in this case and is evidence of the impact of collaboration between the AG's office, the local prosecutor, and defense counsel. And notice here they're talking about a collaboration. We often talk about the American legal system as adversarial. The prosecutor and the defense are are butting heads. They are adversarial. One is trying to go this way. The other is trying to go this way. They are absolutely diametrically opposed. They are at odds. And here they're saying, look, at this point, we're actually trying to collaborate to find out what the truth is. Let's find out what the truth is. Once we figure it out, then we'll figure out how to resolve it. So we find out the wrong guy's in prison. Okay, job number one, get him out. Job number two, find out who actually did do it. Because if this is murder, the statute of limitations is not a problem. So following Friday's hearing, the attorney said, Mr. McCall can now once again enjoy the daily freedoms that so many of us take for granted. The statewide conviction integrity unit is one of the first of its kind in the nation. It reviews claims of innocence in all Michigan counties except for Wayne because Wayne County has its own unit. Wayne County, of course, is where Detroit is. So that's uh, the most populous county in Michigan, I believe. And as a result, they've got their own unit and they take care of that. On March 26, 2005, the crime occurred. Okay, here's what the crime was. Four armed men broke into a house and three people got killed. But another person in the house survived and they became a witness. Now, this all happened in Benton Harbor, again, on the left side of the state of Michigan. That's my left. I know it's your right. The survivor eventually identified McCall as one of the gunmen after seeing a profile during the robbery for one to two seconds. So the survivor glimpsed the profile of someone for a couple seconds, literally, at most, two seconds. And based on the glimpse of the profile, later said, yep, that's him. I recognize him. And that eyewitness identification went a long way towards convicting this man. Now, there's several problems there. One of which is, how much information do you retain in a highly charged situation? Your adrenaline's flowing, you're fearing for your life, and you glimpse the profile of somebody. And you say later in court, yep, yep, that's them, I'm positive. The problem, of course, is that juries love eyewitness identifications. If someone comes into court and goes, yes, that's them, I recognize them. That's them. Juries like that. The only thing they like more is if they actually have photographs or video of the crime itself. So an eyewitness identification goes a long way towards convicting somebody. And again, it's based on a two-second glimpse of the profile of the man. Uh, At trial, McCall had alibi witnesses. uh, And his argument was that he was purchasing items at a Walmart when the crime occurred. Trial testimony from Walmart employees was that those purchases were not made that night, which discredited McCall's statements and contradicted his alibi. So he said, I've got an alibi. And I was at Walmart buying stuff. And they apparently brought in a Walmart employee. He said, no, 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 he bought that stuff at a different time. Um, New information received by the CIU years after the conviction led to the discovery of new witnesses that demonstrated McCall is, in fact, innocent. That evidence includes documents that were unavailable at trial, and those corroborate the innocence. Uh, not in this article, but another article I read, they said that they actually did find a receipt that matched what McCall said from Walmart with the correct time and everything. Uh, but back then, I'm guessing in uh, 2005, they didn't quite have all of the computerized receipt stuff they have now. I understand it was not that long ago in terms of you know modern technology, but I think some things may have changed. The Western Michigan University Cooley Innocence Project assisted with the examination and consideration of the physical evidence, uh, though crime evidence was ultimately immaterial to the identity of the perpetrators. And so, again, they're not telling everything they know here. And I suspect it's because they're tracking down and, and, and building a case against somebody else. With the help of the Benton Harbor Department of Public Safety, a phone was also forensically analyzed that corroborated the new evidence. Again, we don't know what it is, but it corroborated it. So, Back in 2005, December 5th, McCall had been sentenced to serve life without parole. Uh, Michigan does not have a death sentence, has not had one for a long time, uh, but he was sentenced to life without any chance of parole, and uh, he has now been released from prison. Um, The exoneration of Mr. McCall is an example of the importance of a collaboration 
between multiple agents, Michigan's Attorney General, Nessel said. When I established the CIU, I envisioned our office working side-by-side -side with local prosecutors and police departments to uncover the truth. I commend the attorneys and investigators in my office, the local agencies, and the WMU Cooley Innocence Project for their hard work in ensuring justice for Mr. McCall. I commend the Michigan Attorney General's continued ardent commitment to investigate claims of innocence and uncover the truth, said the attorney, Brame, who working for McCall. Uh, in 2018, the Department of the Michigan Attorney General received a post-conviction DNA testing of evidence grant from the Department of Justice to screen claims of innocence and conduct DNA testing in appropriate cases. So uh, that's what they're working on, among other things. And we've talked about this before. The idea that there was not great DNA testing that long ago, but there is now, and the technology is increasing in its ability to tell you stuff, um, it always shocks me when prosecutors object to DNA testing. And I understand that there might be a situation where there could be more than one person's DNA on that, and it still wouldn't make this person innocent. But does it hurt to test it? Just test it and find out, you know. And, and so when they object to it, I've, I've always thought that's strange. But we've talked about it also how some prosecutors have simply got an attitude. They want to win cases. They want to win cases. And I, we've all seen this where there's uh, prosecutors who appear later on TV and talk about their quote-unquote win-loss record, their win-loss record. Um, it's not a game. Wins and losses shouldn't count. It doesn't make any sense. You're, 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 you're you know, comparing apples to oranges here. So the, the point is that some people say courts should be uh, a place where they seek the truth. You know, Lady Justice is blindfolded, not so she can ignore everything. She's blindfolded so she can weigh the truth and simply say, this is the truth or that is the truth. Let's find the truth and go with the truth. You know, so I don't see any comment in this story about the man getting an unfair trial. Uh, it just seems that the amount of evidence that came out at trial, uh, there was more that could have been brought up that wasn't, and some of it may not have been available to his attorneys or even to him. So the point is that they're now saying, look, we've got evidence that points to somebody else. We know that it was somebody else. Therefore, it could not have been him. And so the two-second fleeting glimpse, eh, and, and the alibi that, they brought in Walmart and places. Well, no, that sale took place at some other time. Um, that's what frightens me because here's the other problem. How often do you have an alibi? Do you always have an alibi? And so if I were to pull out a, a calendar and throw a dart at a calendar of the time before today, you know, May, April, March, going back, even just, just, just this year, just this year. I throw a dart at it and pick a day. April 4th, where were you? 9.30 p.m. Where were you at 3.25 p.m.? That day, that exact day. And, you know, because, you know, on, on TV and in the movies, alibis are always cool, you know. <laughs> I couldn't have been doing that. I was over here racing cars or I was, I was over here, you know, doing something important, you know. Now, most people live mundane lives where day after day, <laughs> not a whole lot happens. And, you know, I've, I've actually had it happen before where something happened on a particular day where somebody goes, Steve, what were you doing like two Thursdays ago? And I pull up my calendar because I, I, I do have things that happen most days that I write on my calendar. And I'll be looking at the calendar going, oh, that was the day I did this. I, I remember that day. Where was it at 325 that day? I don't know. I don't know. Who knows? You know, and to think that your life could hinge on your ability to not just remember where you were two weeks ago, but to prove it at to a precise time frame. You know, within this one hour, within this one hour, could you have been at this crime scene? Yes or no? And you say no. I couldn't have been. Prove it. Prove it. Now, interestingly enough, there are things today that, that might help you if you carry a smartphone on you and your smartphone's tracking you, things like that. There are some things that are starting to happen now. But generally speaking, most people were working off their own memories three weeks ago, four weeks ago. Who knows? Who knows? Oh, you might go to prison if you can't prove it. Now you start scrambling to see what you remember. 
But your alibi, you know, so when somebody doesn't have an alibi for where they were, uh, I actually have a lot of sympathy for that. Because like I said, where was I two weeks ago Thursday? I could figure it out. Might take some time. But if my life hinged on it, I'd be scared. So there you go. Great story. I got it off the press release, by the way, from Cooley.edu, which is the law school in Michigan, the Cooley Law School. Uh, so WMU Cooley Innocence Project collaborates to secure the release for Corey McCall after nearly 16 years of wrongful imprisonment. 16 years in prison, but he's out now, which is a good thing. Questions or comments, put them below. Those will talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Lato's Law. If at first you don't succeed, you are like everyone else. It's called learning.